One and all, my name is Brigham Daniels. I am a visiting professor here at the College of Law uh, this year. Um, our next speaker will be um, a Dr. Uh, Bonnie Baxter. Um, this uh, this uh, uh, speech, is, along with the one given by Kevin Perry a bit earlier, is one of two Stegner uh, uh, lectures that are uh, being held this year, which means it's these, these talks will ultimately be published. We're grateful for all the work that both of them have put into these lectures. Um, so without further ado, Bonnie Baxter, who's director of the Great Salt Lake Institute at Westminster College. Hi, uh, good morning. Um, can everyone hear me with this microphone? Good. Um, I move around a lot, so I feel a little stiff with that one. <laughs> Um, I, I am going to talk about uh, something I've been paying a lot of attention to and some folks have alluded to. Um, about four years ago, I did write the obituary for Great Salt Lake to get attention to the lake. So you might not think of me as an optimist, um, but the more that I study the flexibility of the species that live there, I think the more um, I'm thinking optimistically. And so, I wanted to talk about both sides of the coin um, on when we think about life in Great Salt Lake, both the fragility and the vulnerability, but also the resilience. Um, so the questions that I'm really going to focus on are, you know, what what are the threats to the food chains, um, and and what do we pr predict as this basin gets saltier and drier? What we saw last year was otherworldly in terms of how salty the South Arm got. Um, can we increase uh, the water in the lake? If we can, will the life rebound? So last November, as has been pointed to, you know, we hit this historic low. And if you look at this line um, from the hydromapper, this is not good where the biology sits. Do you see we're in the red? Um, and, and that's largely because of the salinity. Um, so we got to, I'm going to talk about salinity in percent today because I think that's a more accessible number for most of us um, instead of molarity or grams per liter or um, other, other um, units. So 19% uh, salt is what we hit in the fall, um, and that's well out of range for what the biology likes. So I uh, just downloaded this video from the International Space Station. They did a flyover at Great Salt Lake a couple weeks ago, and it's absolutely beautiful. But um, what's stunning about the image is how it shows all this snow. So we are a little happy about this reprieve. Um, maybe it buys us a little time. We're hoping that the salinity in the lake this summer can come down to about 15%. Um, that still puts us at about the summer of 2021 or so, so um, we really would like to be better than that. I like to plot the current situation of the lake in the dark blue next to the historic average versus the 1986 high water line because that's not aspirant. We don't want to go to flooding. Um, what, what we want is this 4200 um, lighter blue outline. Uh, so that's, that's really what we're aiming toward. That's our aspiration. And part of the reason is, again, the salinity and how that impacts the biology. So um, I, I made this crude little curve um, just to show you that um, as you increase salinity, and uh, I think this is my pointer. Yes, as you increase salinity, notice my silly little salt shakers. Um, as you increase salinity, you you lessen the biodiversity. So the biodiversity of the ocean at about 3.5% salt is um, is pretty immense, right? You've got animals, you've got you've got all of these incredible life forms living in the ocean. 
when you get to a salinity that's more like the south arm of Great Salt Lake, um, you, you really um, get to something that's way more, um, way less biodiverse. You've got microbialites that feed flies, you've got algae that feed shrimp, and then you've got birds that eat those things. So they really are quite um, uh, simple, these food chains in Great Salt Lake. If you go to the north arm, you really live in a world of bacteria and archaea and these prokaryotic microbes. There also are a host of fungi that we've been isolating, which are kind of fun. Um, but you're in the microorganism world. It doesn't really work well. Oh, and I don't know what happened to that monitor. I didn't do anything. Um, is everybody okay over there? You can see that one. Okay. Oh, I'm back. Okay, so the south arm of Great Salt Lake is really where this talk is going to focus. Um, not just because we've now isolated the north arm for a while, but, all, but because this is where the, uh, the food chains really lie that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and you can think about the food chains as uh, two linear food chains, where the microbialite mats feed the flies on the bottom, and the birds eat that. And, and then the algae in the water column feed the shrimp, and the birds eat those things. Um, and I don't know if the tech people are around. I don't know what's going on with this screen on the left, but you're on it. OK, good. Um, I forgot you're over there. I should be. Hi. <laughs> um, so these linear food chains, these really simple food chains, one of the things I, I want to point out, because I'm really not an ecologist, so I've had to do a lot of reading to think hard about food chains, is, is that the dependency um, is really on these primary producers. Um, the biomass is huge with primary producers in the system, and it really matters how well the algae are doing. This whole system could crash if the algae and cyanobacteria crash. Everything is, is resting on that. Um, so it, it's uh, important when you study microorganisms to think that you are important when most people don't. Ha, ha, ha. Um, OK, this is me um, sampling at the lake about 10 years ago. I have equipment and a dog, as a scientist should have. Um, and I'm using this image to show you just how green the water is sometimes, um, or, or how it was at one time. And in this picture, you can see both the thick microbialite mats which are um, kind of dark. They're so thick and heavy that they're really dark in the water. And you can also see algae that's in the water column itself. Um, and, and so that's very green and very wonderful for the animals that need to eat those things. Um, I, I am talking about this in terms of food chains. And I checked in with a lot of ecologists to ask, um, is it OK if I say food chains instead of food webs? Because I feel like. When I was in you know, middle school, I got corrected for that. So <laughs> I want to make sure it's OK. Um, because it seems to me these food chains are very simple, and they're more chain than web. Um, but there are a couple crossover points. Um, for instance, in the shallows, sometimes the shrimp will graze on these microbialite mats. And, uh, and sometimes the fly larvae who are hanging out in the water column will eat some of the algae in the water column. They're pretty indiscriminate feeders, you know, whatever fits in their mouth. Um, so it makes sense that there's some crossover. Um, there's also a little bit of crossover with the birds. There's some birds that eat both shrimp and flies. Um, but that's about the extent of it. People use the idea, the concept of food webs to describe intricacies and hierarchies and so forth, and we don't have a lot of that. So I'm going to continue to talk about these as food chains for the moment. And it helps me isolate the species involved and tell you how salinity is going to impact them. So let's start with the brine shrimp food chain. Um, so who do they eat? Um, if you look at who's in the water in terms of the algae, um, Phil Brown and others have um, published this nice paper that, that used genetics to amplify everybody who was present. And they found there's some diatoms. Um, well, brine shrimp don't particularly like those guys in feeding experiments. They're sometimes bigger than their mouths, and they're really crunchy because they're full of silica. They're not really happy about that. 
um, they will eat some cyanobacteria that you know happen along in the water column. But one of the most prevalent organisms that you see visually in a microscope um, in, in, at certain times in the lake water is Denaliella, um, particularly Denaliella vertis in the south arm of the lake. And that's a little picture I have of a Denaliella um, swimming around. That's their favorite food. So um, I'm going to focus on that a little bit. Um, as I introduce their scientific name to you, Artemia franciscana, because it's the same species they have in the San Francisco um, salt ponds. Um, it's really hard to take video of them without them having sex, so I'm really sorry. It's kind of like, it's kind of like showing porn in a uh, private setting. Um, but they are cute little monkeys. Um, so uh, the Artemia life cycle is interesting because um, they, they, they do have live birth in the summer, and those guys grow up and they make more babies. Um, and it is a stress response for them to insist their embryos and to put them aside in these little cysts. And so the cold temperatures that come later in the fall will cause them to form cysts um, instead of live birth. And, and so when they do that, it again, it's a stress response. And then all of the adults die in the cold winter temperatures. And the cysts are floating on the lake and ready for the next spring when it warms up and they get some fresh water streaming and they hatch again. Um, so the, the cyst form is really important. So last summer, one of the observations um, that the Great Salt Lake e Ecosystem Program uh, had and the Brian Shrimp Companies was, was that the, they, ins they s insisted their embryos early. They did that in the summer. And then some of those cysts, of course, started to come out of dormancy by the time we got to winter. So there's some concern about that shift in the life cycle. But notice also they are responding to stress in the environment. In, in particular, the high salinity was stressing them out then. So they said, hey, my world is dying. Let me uh, insist some embryos. So they do have strategies to deal with this, right? And I think that's an important observation. It, you can get kind of sad about it, but you also can get kind of happy that they have strategies. Whoops. Um, so let's talk about what happens when the water gets too salty for that Denaliella um, and also for the brine shrimp. What happens to the microalgae? What happens to the shrimp? First, I need to take us back to when you were 12 and you had to memorize something about osmosis. And there was something about a membrane we're not sure what it was. Um, what, what happens is water can move in and out of cellular membranes. So no matter what kind of organism you are, you are made of cells, and your cells do osmotic behavior. So water can move, but molecules can't move without a lot of energy. So consider this. If you have a lot of things on the outside of the membrane, like those large blue spheres, um, then uh, the water wants to rush from the left side over to the right. Does that make sense? It wants to dilute what is outside. And so if you're a cell living, if you put our cells in salt water and looked at them under a microscope, they send their water to the outside and they shrivel up, okay? That's why we can't live in Great Salt Lake. Well, there's, you know, breathing oxygen too. That's important. But um, the, other, the other thing that happens to things that are designed by evolution to live in a high salt environment is they will accumulate molecules on the other side um, of that membrane inside the cell. And that helps them balance osmotically. And then they don't shoot all their water across the membrane. Um, so that's really important. And so all everybody who lives in a high salt environment, they have a means to do that. Some of the halophiles I study accumulate lipids inside their cells to do that. Um, Denaliella accumulates glycerol uh, to balance. Um, this is energy expensive. As you go up in salt, you need to make more balancing molecules, right? So um, it gets really expensive for the cells to turn on all these factories to, to produce all of these molecules. So it's exhausting to the cells, and, and they can do that for some time. But I point to time because we don't know what that time course is. 
so this is why on the south side of the causeway, um, where this green water lies, um, we have these um, vibrant, this vibrant ecosystem. But on the north side, we're really um, just flourishing at the microbial level with these uh, pink mi microbes that live there. So it's less salty over here than it is over here. So if you ask the question, and these scientists did, um, of what is the favorite salinity of a Denaliella? I know some people go to sleep at night wondering that question. Um, and it is two molar, and I've translated that into percent for our conversation, around 12%. So this red line, around 12% is their happy place. They like that. They like that. They don't really like it um, higher than that. So if you look at, if you look at Denaliella um, as you increase salinity across here, more and more and more salt, um, and right about here is 12%, um, you start to accumulate glycerol. That's what's on this axis here. So more and more and more glycerol gets accumulated inside. Again, that's a strategy to balance, but it's also carbon storage. Every glycerol molecule has three carbons. So it's like, I better hang on to this food, right? So it's helping them bal balance osmotically. But it has made me wonder about brine shrimp and how even if the Denaliella are lower in the population, the number of them, because they're having a hard time growing, because reproduction takes expense as well, and that high salt, they reproduce less quickly, as I showed you in the last graph. So, but maybe each cell is more nutritious because it has a lot of glycerol, right? So you're getting more bang for your buck, right? More at the buffet. Okay, so the shrimp themselves, they are dealing at high salt with less food, but they also require more energy to do reproduction um, and, and high salt and to balance themselves in the salt. And if you look through the literature, you'll see that 12% is their happy place. That is when they do their best reproduction. Um, and uh, the juveniles, though, are rather flexible. 90% of them will survive to maturity um, in, in a range between 10 and 17%. So shrimp are probably one of the most flexible animals in terms of salt concentration. They can just uh, turn on and off the systems they need to survive. But it can't go on forever because it's stressful, right? It, you know how um, sometimes in your life you have these really stressful periods where you're working really hard or you're doing a lot of stuff but it, and it's intense. But then you say, okay, this can't go on forever. I have to now go on vacation, right? Um, so I, I think it's kind of like that. What is the timeline? We really don't know. Um, my background is genetics, so I'm going to show you a gene map, but you don't have to even know what the genes are. I just want you to pay attention to the colors. Um, these are salinities that correspond to, in this case, 3.5%. Um, so at 3.5, at ocean salinity, um, the brine shrimp is firing off these genes trying to do basic metabolism and reproduction, um, not terribly happy, um, but it's not firing off stress genes. Um, when you go up in salinity, um, you see the stress genes start to come on at the expense of basic metabolism. So in that final, um, over here in that final column, that 23%, now we're getting up towards the north arm and the, the shrimp are really stressed and they're not able to turn on their basic processes. So it's, it's important to think about um, what that means. For those of us who have spent some time working in the north arm, when you see shrimp up there, they're small, and they're bright red because carotenoids are antioxidants. They're trying to prevent damage to their cells at that high salinity. So uh, they're not happy. Their happy place is also around 12%. But they're flexible. OK, so back to the food chains. And let's switch over to the right-hand side. And let's talk about the flies. So I've spent a lot of time studying microbialite mats. And I know some of you in the room probably haven't heard of microbialites, so I want to explain them for a second. These luscious, that's right, you use luscious when you're a scientist, um, microbialite mats that grow 
and do photosynthesis and cause the precipitation of calcium carbonate. Um, and that forms a rock. So it's literally biology that makes geology, which I think is so cool. Um, but you can see that thick, you can almost feel the texture of this mat. And on there, um, the lighting isn't great for that in here, but on here you can see little brine fly pupa and you can see little brine fly larva. The brine fly larva are basically the caterpillar, if you remember the butterfly story, um, how you have the adults that make a caterpillar that becomes a cocoon that then hatches into a butterfly. Well, it's a little less sexy, but brine flies do the same thing. And, and so here are the little caterpillar forms, and then they form the little cocoons on the microbialites. And these should be underwater. This is one we've pulled out of water just for the picture. Um, this is my student, Victoire, and we were out at uh, the lake um, in the summer of 2021. This is when this was, and you can see the mats. So these, these microbialite mats should look nice and thick and dark under um, the water uh, where they can both feed the brine flies and also provide a substrate for them to make their little cocoons on and pupate. Um, so this is a brand new graphic. Um, my uh, co colleague who's a scientist and also a graphic artist has been working on some of these for me um, that you'll see today, including the food chains, Sheila Hamburger, and I'll thank her in the acknowledgments again. But um, the flies lay eggs on the surface of the lake. Um, these turn into the little caterpillars. The larvae have a few stages as they grow. They go down to the microbialites and they munch munch, munch, munch on those cyanobacterial-based mats. And then they pupate, and then this is the coolest part. Um, they have this cool like um, crevice in the top of their exoskeleton of their head that opens up, a balloon pops out, busts the end of the pupa off, um, and then goes back together, closes their head, and they're birthed into an air bubble underwater. And that is just the coolest thing ever. I just picture zombie flies walking around with these balloons coming out of their heads. But anyway, uh, these flies then come up. After all of that work, they, they are, are uh, released to the surface of the water, and a bird eats them. So it seems like a lot of energy um, to put into one's life until you realize that they spend like six to nine months as a larva and only three days as an adult fly. So they're really having all their fun time when they're a larva. Um, so what happens to these mats when it gets too salty? And what happens to the flies when it gets too salty? So we know that the microbialites are very vulnerable to both uh, too salty and too dry, hypersalinity and desiccation. Um, they are in the shallows of the lake because they need to collect sunshine. And so as the lake shrinks, they're being exposed. So just, they're just vulnerable because of their location, first of all. Um, and we also are seeing, um, we have studied the structures in the north arm, and they have no cyanobacteria left in them. Um, so we think they're vestiges from when this was one lake. So we do know they can get too salty and they can die. The question again is timeline. How long can they be at that high salinity? Um, and we know that the beached microbialites will lose their mats on the surface, but we have some experiments now to show that underneath that carbonate, um, those carbonate granules, those mats can probably replenish themselves, and we're seeing that in the lab. So this is a picture um, that I took, uh, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe almost 10 years ago now of these microbialite structures out in the north arm. Um, and you can just see visually that they're dead. They, they don't have mats and they're, they've got salt crust on them and they're living in this pink water. Um, and what we're seeing in the south arm now, uh, this was early last summer in June. Um, they were really starting, th these were the same structures I showed you with Victoire that were underwater in 2021. Um, and then if you notice um, this past summer, this is what happened. Um, they, the water just was nowhere and obviously these look dead, but can we rehydrate them? I'll show you that in just a minute. So we published a paper in Ecology a few years ago um, that looked at microcosm experiments with microbialites and 
Um, the optimum was around 10%. We didn't do anything between 10 and 15, um, but at 15, you can see that it starts to go down. Um, 20 and 25%, I would say, are restrictive salinities. We actually started to lose the mats. They died, and we're measuring chlorophyll as a proxy, for example, and, and we were also were measuring DNA of the organisms that lived there. So we had two measures of abundance, and they were just going down, down, down. So that salinity is not good. Last year, we got to 19%. It makes sense why the mats were dying everywhere we went. Um, because they are probably at a restrictive salinity. Um, so we didn't do 19% in this particular experiment, um, but I'm pretty sure it's close enough to that uh, restrictive boundary that that's what was happening. Um, so the mats are protected by something called uh, an exopolysaccharide matrix. And it's kind of, I liken it to slime or goo. Um, they, they extrude this and they become a biofilm, and that helps them capture these carbonate granules and form the rock. But it also protects them. Um, I was just reading a paper yesterday about a cyanobacterium that was sent into space for a space exposure experiment. And it turns out that this, um, the, the cells on the surface died, but, but because of that EPS, um, and the layer of cells on the surface, the cells underneath survived. So I think this could be a helpful survival mechanism um, to protect. And we know that uh, from the literature, it protects against UV light, it protects against high salinity, pH shifts, osmotic shock, all kinds of things. So I think um, I'm hopeful that these mats can survive in part because of this sticky goo. We gotta come up with a better word for it than EPS. Um, we've been isolating this Euhalothesis species in our lab. Um, and I'll give a shout out to my student, Caitlin Christensen, who's been taking pieces of microbialites and streaking them onto plates and isolating lots of different cultures and trying to amplify their DNA. Um, our goal is to sequence the genome of a good isolate and uh, to try to probe that for genes involved in resiliency. So we'll look for more in the future on that. Um, so back to this picture of a microbialite, just to remind you, the flies are eating and pupating on this structure. It's a very, very important structure for them. Um, and you can see that this is work by Dave Herbst, who is a brine fly god, and he mostly works at Mono Lake. Um, this is work he did in these salt ponds in the Mojave Desert, actually. And I'll just uh, make this quick. So this isn't at Great Salt Lake, but we can learn from his study. This is um, his low saline pools. He counted, if you see the blue is larva, the orange is pupa, um, and the gray is, uh, are the adults. And, and so he, he counted uh, flies in ponds that were considered low, that were in this range, in ponds that were medium. That's the happy place, remember, the 9 to 12% for many of our species, um, and in high salinity ponds. And it seems like under the low salinity conditions, they were doing fine. Medium, um, everybody seems to be good. Uh, for some reason, the larva tended to do better at the lower salinity. Um, and uh, what's interesting to me is at the high salinity, and again, above, in this case, 14% and above, uh, the flies were starting to uh, be smaller and smaller in number. Um, another experiment he did that I'm just going to add on this graph was to look at the, the pupa, which I have a little drawing of on the right, those little cocoons, and see how many of them had opened. If they've opened, that means that a brine fly was born. And if the pupa casings instead were closed, the brine fly was stuck inside and, and never came out into the world. And, and so he used these open um, bars to show um, where open cases had released flies. So I put a little fly in there to remind you. Um, so that's just percentage. So most of the flies had hatched out of those um, pupa in that case, and in the high salinity, a much smaller proportion had hatched. So 
we do know from other studies on the same species of our main fly, um, Ephedra uh, cinerata, that, that we are indeed looking at a situation where we are not in their happy place, and this makes perfect sense why we started seeing the flies crash last year. Um, I'll give a shout out to Carly Beetle, who's trying to get um, REI to endorse her by wearing her orange puff in every media event. <laughs> um, she has been studying the, the flies as I've been studying the microbialites, and Dave Herbst came out, and thank you to Friends of Great Salt Lake and National Audubon for helping us to fund his visit. He helped train Carly and our students on what to do and what to look for, and they continue to work together and call each other Team Fly. Um, so here's Dave working with our student Cora, um, uh, collecting flies in the field, and we've now, uh, this is Bridget and, and Cora in the lab, um, they've now set up different uh, pupation experiments at different salinities. Um, they, he even sent them to BYU to, um, to look at old insects that had been pinned because he wanted to know what was the size of Great Salt Lake flies in the past. And if you ask an entomologist, they're like, we have those. We have them from 1923, right? So um, Cora actually went down there with Carly and measured the size of these flies. And so now they're doing microscopy on these current uh, flies in pupa. And what we're seeing is that they're smaller. They're smaller than they should be. So smaller in number and smaller in size. Those are the preliminary observations. And this spring, uh, they're setting up monitoring experiments. And hopefully with a good water year, we'll have a good fly year. And that will serve as a good baseline as we experience drought in the future. Um, some of their pictures are kind of gruesome. Um, but this is a young uh, larva. This is a pupa. And this is an adult. And this is a video. You can see the itty bitty larva crawling around, uh, brine shrimp cyst for scale. Um, and this is a pupa at the bottom. Um, you can see how itty bitty some of these early larvae are. And you can watch them just crawl around and eat off the microbialite. Here's a bigger larva. It's really gruesome, really creepy. I want to be one for Halloween. Um, so now let's go to the top of the food chain and let's think a little bit about how the birds are impacted by salinity because I'm not a birdologist and I was thinking for a while um, that the birds were just going to struggle because they couldn't find food, right? That, that it'll affect the birds because when I look at this pyramid, I'm like, well, if the primary producers are low and the shrimp and flies are low, of course the birds are going to struggle, right? That makes sense to me. But as I started reading more about it, it's more than just food. So first, let's talk about the food. Um, I want to give a shout out to Mike Conover, who's done a ton of this work. And I have some of his papers, including the chapter in our book, is the, the first uh, reference. And also, Anthony Roberts did a great review that includes a lot of work from DWR. Um, and, uh, and, and so altogether, what I've learned, and I've tried to organize this in terms of flies and uh, shrimp. So I've started off with the shrimp eaters. At the bottom are the fly eaters. And I've tried to include what parts of the life cycle um, the birds are eating. And thank you to National Audubon, particularly Max Malmquist, and to John Neal at, um, at GSLAP, who have really helped put this together um, in terms of uh, finding all the references. And I turned it into a graphical representation. I hope it's OK, John. Um, so notice there's some birds in the middle that eat both shrimp and flies. There's some that are wholly dependent on shrimp or wholly dependent on flies, um, but different parts of their life cycle are represented. These are birds that are here in very, very large numbers. These are important birds. Um, and I think people have thrown around uh, the question, if we have um, an Endangered Species Act listing in the future, what birds would it be? And the answer usually falls to the eared grebe, who really depends on shrimp and flies, um, and also um, Wilson's phalarope. Um, not redneck phalarope, but the Wilson's phalarope, who very much depends on flies. So we've got to keep the shrimp and the flies healthy, and that means keeping the algae and the cyanobacteria healthy. 
and that means lowering the salinity of the lake. And how do we do that? Repeat after me, get water to the lake. <laughs> All right, that's how we do that. Um, these grebes are so darling. I don't know if you've ever been out on the water and they just come up to you. They think your boat's a big grebe and they talk to you. Um, this is a picture I took of phalaropes. I was actually sampling microbialites. Do you see the flies? Yeah, we didn't see that last summer. Um, this is a gull flying, uh, doing that open mouth gesture. I won't do that dance in front of everyone, but we did invent a dance to show gulls eating flies. Um, so I, I, I'm keying this up for John Loft, who's coming on in just a couple minutes, um, to, because he's going to talk more about the birds. So the birds are impacted by high salinity, like I said, because of loss of food um, and also loss of habitat. Um, they, as the lake is shrinking, their habitat is changing. Um, and I also want to point out that uh, many species require all these different little sub-ecosystems within the lake um, in order to nest at one spot, feed at another spot, etc. And so I think also that's something we don't think about. This habitat is changing as the lake is shrinking, and that's really important. It's not just about the dried microbialites and loss of pupation habitat um, for the brine flies and the birds that need, need them to live. Um, I read something about this yesterday about behavior changes that people see birds experience as water gets saltier at other systems, that they have to fly more to get to fresh water, which I thought was kind of interesting. But the thing I'm really um, learning a lot about is this, is this osmoregulation. I'm really thinking about this a lot lately. And it turns out that birds have to do this too. So they, many of these water birds have um, salt glands that helps them take in a bunch of salt water and extrude the salt because the salt isn't good for them. Um, and I've actually uh, had John uh, help me sample salt glands of pelicans out on Gunnison Island, sorry. But we did grow some cool microbes out of, out of the salt glands. That was neat. Uh, we just swabbed them. We didn't hurt them. Um, and I'm pointing to their nostrils in the back of their throat because they're in their trachea. Who knew? Um, so salts can accumulate um, in the bird and they need to get rid of it and and that's really kind of cool this figure comes from this paper I referenced um, About all the different ways that birds can deal with salt So to end this I just wanted to mention the resiliency and flexibility that I've already talked about um, That EPS that goo that is secreted by cyanobacteria could be helpful accumulation of the glycerol and the microalgae the invertebrates have their flexibility in terms of brine shrimp reproductive flexibility. Brine fly have refugia, and I didn't really talk about that, but Sam, some of us and others have talked about um, groundwater around the lake coming up in little pools and making less saline pools where the brine flies can kind of hang out when the main body of the lake gets too salty. And then when the water comes back into the lake, they can um, rehab it that that system and birds obviously have uh, flexible mechanisms for getting rid of salt and diet switching and so forth but again what is the recovery timeline we know um, from work that Carrie Franz has done uh, that my lab helped with um, we have a paper that's been submitted that hopefully will be accepted soon um, we know that we can rehydrate these microbialites and bring them back to life um, so there's enough cyanobacteria after a few months, um, and even if, if they get too dry, but how long, how long? After a few months, yes, we can bring them back to life. This is a picture from Gunnison Island. These are some microbialites um, that are both too dry and too salty. We know that decades is too long, right? So we've done that experiment. Decades is too long. Months, we can bring them back to life. So the key take homes for me, are that um, a declining lake really means a reduction in habitat and food, and that high salinity can cause osmoregulation stress. And the timeline is, is uncertain. And I'll give a shout out to the wetlands really quickly. I didn't talk about the wetlands. I'm just talking about the open water. Um, also, another thing you read about when you read about trophic levels is concentration of toxins, and that's something also to consider when we're talking about food chains. 
So I'll just thank everybody. Um, Carly Beadle, our team fly captain, and our students, Sheila Homberger, who did the uh, food chain and life cycle graphics for us, and um, our collaborators that we're working with right now at various institutions. So, um, and lastly, on the bottom are our funding sources. Thank you so much. So we're running a, a little short on time, but we'll make time for one question. Is there a question from the audience? Yes. The question is, the north end uh, completely written off as a dead zone. Um, that's an excellent question. Uh, I think, no, uh, I'm on the Salinity Advisory Committee for the state, and so I'll speak for the committee for a moment, that we see it as a temporary measure um, and a way to modulate. And there might actually be some optimum times to uh, lower the breach in the berm and let south arm uh, water take some salt over. Um, so there might be good times in the year we can actually use it to take more salt to the north arm. Um, but right now, because it's been a long time, decades since there's been a vibrant ecosystem in the north arm, um, it, we think that's necessary to protect the birds and the, the life in the south arm. All right, thank you thank so much. You. All right, um, we are now going to hear from um, John Thomas Loft, who is going to talk about, uh, we're gonna hear more about uh, the birds of the Great Salt Lake. Um, since we're running short, let, why don't we just start there? Thank you. Thank you, I uh, really appreciate this opportunity to uh, uh, speak to you today, especially since you uh, have listened to a lot of, uh, let's see if I can get this, listen to a lot of professors and uh, uh, elected officials, and I'm just a dude that likes wildlife, so uh, hopefully I can uh, pick up where Bonnie left off and uh, talk a little bit about why uh, Great Salt Lake is what we would consider an avian oasis. And I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna lightning through all of this as fast as I can because I got a lot of info here. Uh, but I'll run through a, a, a year in, at Great Salt Lake um, and we'll just uh, go through each of the seasons. Uh, so we'll start off with the spring migration because that's right where we're at right now. We see a lot of birds coming from their wintering grounds. Uh, headed towards the, uh, where they wanna uh, breed. Uh, so some of the, those birds will have their destination here and a lot of them uh, will be just traveling through. Uh, Great Salt Lake is centered in, or uh, affiliated with the Pacific Flyway. About a billion birds use the, uh, that flyway. And uh, it's important to, uh, where Great Salt Lake is located, it's a key to habitat integrity of the Pacific Flyway. And what I mean by that is uh, uh, it's, set, it's located in this cold desert region where water features are few and far between. So if those birds get here and they're not uh, able to uh, get what they need, uh, they got a long ways to go. Um, it also, uh, we get a lot of birds that come from the Central Flyway as well, but more, uh, more so in the Pacific Flyway. So Great Salt Lake uh, serves as, uh, for the birds, similar to what it would serve for us if we went on a vacation. We got to stop and get fuel at some point. Uh, that's exactly what happens with these uh, birds. They uh, come to Great Salt Lake. This is kind of a pit stop for them, and they uh, head on out, and uh, uh, after they've refueled, kind of what uh, Bonnie was talking about with all the uh, brine flies and invertebrates, we have over 12 million birds that utilize uh, uh, Great Salt Lake uh, on a regular basis. And I'm going to go hit some of the highlight birds uh, here, the Wilson's phalarope. Uh, we have the largest uh, staging concentrations of uh, Wilson's phalarope in the world here at Great Salt Lake. Uh, half a million birds strong. Uh, you see these birds uh, uh, when they're flying, they look like smoke or uh, as they fly and change direction, it looks like smoke or a, a ribbon in the uh, wind. 
So these birds, we had a PhD student that, uh, well, she's a doctor now, and she uh, identified both Ogden Bay and Farmington Bay as crucial habitats for these, uh, uh, for the phalaropes. Unfortunately, in fact, in the middle of her uh, study, uh, Ogden Bay basically went dry and we just didn't see uh, the birds there the second year of her program. And basically Farmington Bay has gone uh, dry over the uh, last decade as well. So we're uh, reducing the amount of habitat and this is what they're feeding on, just like Bonnie said, the brine flies. Uh, and that fuels them for their thousands of miles of uh, journey that's uh, ahead of them. So we get, that's just one species. We have over uh, 300 different species that uh, utilize the lake. So I'm obviously not gonna go over all of those, but I uh, do wanna hit some of the really good uh, representatives here. So this is the another shorebird, the marble godwit. And Great Salt Lake is the only staging area for marble godwits uh, in the interior US. Uh, we get over 40,000 of them here, and uh, most of the time they spend, or most of their time is spent in Bear River Bay and uh, Willard Spur, um, as well as the refuge. And they're probing into the mud to get, uh, take advantage of invertebrates uh, that are there. However, it's hard to probe uh, in dirt. Uh, it's a lot less effective, so it's almost like jackhammering through uh, concrete. And these birds aren't able to, to do that, take advantage of uh, uh, the invertebrates. If they're not there, there's no habitat available for them. Uh, waterfowl species that we see a lot of is tundra swans. 75% of the entire Western population uh, comes here, uh, about 75,000 uh, tundra swans, and they're relying on a different uh, uh, food source, and that's the aquatic, uh, sub submerged aquatic vegetation. In particular, that's uh, sago pondweed tubers. Uh, and they come through here twice a year, usually uh, uh, big numbers in the fall as well as the spring. So we just had uh, Swan Day last, uh, this past weekend. Uh, they're coming from the Central Valley in California and then heading uh, from here up to Alaska where they'll be uh, uh, nesting. So all of these birds, like Bonnie mentioned, are attracted to these highly uh, productive uh, wetlands. And she said she didn't uh, uh, hit on this. Well, uh, I plan to do that. Um, we, as she mentioned with uh, these wetlands, the uh, reduction in salinity actually increases the diversity for uh, species that use it, as well as the species of vegetation, as well as uh, insects that uh, also, also use these areas. Uh, we have a lot of a, a diverse amount of habitats, emergent, emergent, wet meadow, playa. All of these areas have great uh, numbers of acreages along the uh, eastern side of uh, Great Salt Lake, and they supply these birds uh, with a lot of forage. So this is almost the obligatory uh, maps of uh, Great Salt Lake at its highest, at its average, and then at its lowest, which is what we see here. And mostly what I wanted to uh, uh, call your attention to is uh, that eastern uh, side of uh, uh, the Great Salt Lake, which has reduced a lot of that uh, wetland habitat that is more productive. So when we uh, hear people talk about, well, the Great Salt Lake is half of what it used to be, it's even less than half over on these more productive uh, marshes and habitats, especially in Bear River Bay, Ogden Bay, and uh, Farmington Bay, where you can just see this is kind of a brown uh, batch of dirt. So uh, the cool part is, is when Great Salt Lake is uh, high, its dynamic shoreline makes it uh, really productive for a lot of these uh, invertebrates that uh, they feed on, especially in the marshes. Um, it gives these uh, birds a lot of different locations that they can take advantage of and uh, unique habitat types. And that takes us into uh, the summer season, but I'm gonna call it nesting season because that's what uh, birds are doing at that time. So if they're here in the uh, middle of the summer, they're mostly here uh, to reproduce and feed their uh, chicks and raise their chicks. Um, so 
this is when we see uh, peak numbers of insects. And if you've been on the marsh in the summer and didn't wear mosquito repellent, uh, you probably regretted it. And that's uh, uh, a good thing for the birds, not so much for us. Um, so we see this huge number of insects that uh, are produced in these marshes that provide a uh, food source for a lot of these uh, birds. Then like Bonnie was uh, talking about, this is uh, the microbialite habitat. It's not homogenous throughout the lake. It's just around these edges. Uh, so this red indicates where microbialite habitat uh, is located. Uh, and so it's not in the deeper portions of the lake, so uh, we start losing it. And uh, here's just a picture that, uh, of a productive uh, field of mo microbialites under the water, and this is what uh, uh, the same exact location and what it looked like uh, this year. And so uh, I think Dr. Perry mentioned this as well, as uh, brine fly, the brine fly life cycle relies on these microbialites. Uh, they attach to these uh, in the middle of the winter uh, and then do exactly like Bonnie says, they hatch out and this is uh, uh, usually clouds and clouds of these uh, uh, brine flies uh, uh, pop out in the summer and they, they are food for everything. I do disagree with what Bonnie said. Uh, if you're out on the, the shoreline and you see these clouds of uh, brine flies, uh, they don't bite you. Uh, all of all they do uh, at this time of year, so she, she mentioned that uh, they have their most fun when they're in the larval stage. Uh, basically all the adults do are mate, uh, so I would say that's when they probably have the most fun. <laughs> So that's a high source of protein for these birds. The other thing that's been mentioned is the high salinity, and this looks like a really busy graph, but, uh, and all of these different colored uh, lines here are different, uh, represent different years. Uh, we've been measuring salinity for a long time, but I'll just direct your attention to the dark lines. The uh, black one is actually uh, the average of the salinities that we see. And then the red uh, is what we saw this year, so far uh, exceeding any uh, value that we've had in the past. And that impacts both uh, zooplankton that are in the uh, south arm of the lake, which is the brine uh, flies and the brine shrimp. Uh, so that has an impact on uh, these nesting birds. So a few uh, that are, uh, I'll just highlight a couple of birds that are, this area is really important for. Gadwalls, uh, this is the largest breeding ground for gadwalls in the western U.S., um, 40,000 strong. Uh, a lot of times we get quadruple that uh, when they're migrating. Farmington Bay is one of the most uh, productive areas for uh, uh, gadwalls, and you can see from this uh, map that uh, Basically, uh, Great Salt Lake is kind of a hub for uh, uh, the gadwalls. Can't talk about uh, birds without mentioning uh, pelicans. They're the most uh, obvious one that you see when you're uh, an easily identify identifiable. Uh, almost anybody can tell what a pelican is, and we've got the, one of the largest breeding colonies of American white pelicans in the world here at uh, Great Salt Lake. And they're nesting at Gunnison Island, uh, which is why the uh, water here is pink, and you would uh, you realize that there are no uh, fish in that, but they still utilize it. Um, 20,000 is uh, about where our peak uh, a uh, number of adults for breeding here has been, but in recent years, uh, that's about half. Um, so the reason they use this, even though there's no fish, is because they're, the, the island is protected. Uh, great, uh, the Division of Wildlife owns the island. There's a one-mile halo around it, so people can't uh, go on there. Uh, and it's typically, when it is an island, uh, inaccessible to predators, however, it's been uh, a little more accessible lately because it's not an island. And so uh, when I say predators, I'm mostly talking about coyotes and that has had an impact on uh, numbers. Uh, so not only do uh, we get the pelicans that breed on Gunnison Island, but uh, these marshes along the uh, Wasatch Front um, uh, that we manage for uh, 
waterfowl habitat uh, also have a lot of carp in them. And so uh, we get uh, non-breeding pelicans that come here. So uh, pelicans don't reach sexual maturity until about the age of three. So a lot of these birds uh, just come here just for uh, the good food. And it takes uh, uh, a pelican chick, it requires about 150 pounds of fish for it to uh, raise, uh, or once it hatches to uh, be able to fly uh, and reach uh, fledging age. And so uh, that's a lot of food over the course of the summer. And these uh, adult pelicans have to, have to travel uh, sometimes great distances. Typically they would like to feed uh, close to uh, their nesting grounds, uh, and that would be Bear River Bay or uh, Willard Spur or some of the marshes, but uh, we've put satellite transmitters on these and been able to track them uh, to different places, and they go over 100 miles uh, uh, to get uh, some of their uh, uh, fish for their uh, young. And the farther they have to travel, the less likely they are to succeed in nesting. So uh, it's better when we have a little uh, little bit of marsh uh, on the eastern side. So we'll go from one of the largest uh, birds to one of the smallest, the snowy plover. And Great Salt Lake hosts the lar uh, world's largest assemblage of snowy plovers. Almost a quarter of the entire breeding population uh, in the west is here. And they're nesting mostly on the shoreline. So uh, these mud flats are uh, uh, western shores of Great Salt Lake, and they're, of course, taking advantage of the brine flies and the brine shrimp when they're here. Uh, and hopefully those uh, numbers are good enough to supply uh, uh, the snowy plovers to be successful. So redheads are another species of duck that uh, had been a real popular species here, 20,000 breeding adults, 150,000 migrating. And before the floods, uh, it, uh, Great Salt Lake had the co greatest concentration of breeding redheads in North America in terms of uh, birds per wetland acre. Uh, unfortunately, after the uh, lake receded, um, it, uh, diminished a lot of the habitat uh, for uh, redheads. So that's a loss of uh, nesting habitat due to the expansion of Phragmites. Uh, so uh, the bulrush, uh, the alkali bulrush stands uh, basically were taken over by this invasive uh, species and that's reduced the number of uh, redheads nesting here. Uh, one of the other things, and this is probably not as important, uh, is carp uh, with the sediments that they stir up. Uh, they reduce the amount of pond weed available to these birds, and that's also had an impact uh, on redheads. So what's good for pelicans, not so good for uh, redheads. So that's the bad news. Redheads, uh, we've lost a lot of habitat uh, with them. However, there's uh, plenty of habitat for blondes and brunettes, so we're not so much worried about them. Uh, I'm just making sure you guys were all paying attention. <laughs> so avocets are another species. They're one of the ones that we're uh, probably going to list as a species of greatest conservation need. Uh, we had had uh, uh, close to a, qu a quarter of a million at peak counts, uh, but this is back in the late 90s, uh, and that's higher than any other wetland in the Pacific Flyway. Um, they uh, are showing up right now and uh, want to nest on some of the islands or the uh, shallow alkaline wetlands, but as uh, Bear River Bay and Ogden Bay and uh, uh, Farmington Bay have kind of diminished to just a mud flat, it doesn't provide a lot of nesting habitat for avocets, so we've seen those numbers uh, uh, cut in half as well. Uh, so Farmington Bay has been a kind of a stronghold for avocets, and we're just not seeing as many nest here. So which state has the most uh, California goals? You would think it's California, but it's not. It's Utah. We have the largest breeding population of uh, California goals in the world, so maybe we should switch the name to Utah goal, I guess. Uh, we've had uh, documented 160 uh, thousand breeding adults, and if they're successful, they usually uh, about double uh, that number. 
but they're mostly nesting on these islands. And right now there are no islands on Great Salt Lake. So uh, their uh, success have been, has been reduced uh, considerably. And like everybody says, they're taking advantage of both brine shrimp and brine flies. Uh, especially during the nesting season, they are really keyed in on brine flies because that's a high source of protein to raise their chicks. Almost always, um, goals will uh, have three chicks, uh, an odd number, but I think the reason uh, for that is because it's a lot easier to sit on three eggs than it is to sit on two eggs. And if you think about it, it'd be uncomfortable on your butt to sit on two eggs. And I, I'm certain I verified that with this uh, picture here. This is an actual uh, nest and this uh, goal had only two eggs and it was so uncomfortable it found a tennis ball to sit on. <laughs> So I'm pretty sure only two of these uh, eggs hatched. Uh, if the other one did, I'd be really surprised. Uh, Pete Sampras or something came out of there. Uh, so now we're moving into uh, fall migration. And this is when we see the most birds at Great Salt Lake. So the highest numbers of birds uh, at any time of the year is going to be in the, our fall migration. Uh, this is uh, when Great Salt Lake is uh, really productive. Uh, both out on the lake as well as the marshes. And we see the most numbers of uh, uh, shorebirds at this time. So not only do we peak in uh, uh, diversity, uh, uh, diverse, diversity of species of shorebirds, but we also just see uh, the sheer numbers at this time of year. Uh, not only uh, do, do we get a lot of shorebirds, but this is, of course, uh, waterfowl season as well. So we see a lot of ducks, a lot of times between three and five million, uh, or it had been between three and five million when we also had water uh, in the, the lake. And this is a picture of a green wing teal. And if you're going to harvest a, a, a duck or see a duck uh, in the marsh, this is kind of what we call our bread and butter duck because that's uh, what we see the most of at this time of year. Over half a million uh, green winged teal. Um, they're all throughout uh, our marshes, so you can't hardly go uh, bird watching uh, in the fall and not see a green winged teal. Um, and they're coming from their nesting grounds in the boreal forests of Canada and Alaska. Uh, and then they spend most of their fall here from September, uh, usually towards the end of December. Can't talk about any birds on Great Salt Lake without mentioning eared grebes because uh, Great Salt Lake is so uh, tied to these birds because uh, they eat brine shrimp and we manage the brine shrimp fishery. Uh, they exclusively eat brine shrimp when they're here in the fall. So 99.99% of their diet is uh, uh, brine shrimp and they become flightless when they're here. So it's really critical that uh, once they arrive here that there is a food source because uh, they are, uh, once they molt, um, uh, they're unable to take off and leave here. So uh, they're restricted to this area and they are reliant on uh, having that brine shrimp uh, food for them. And when they do come here, they're in such large numbers, it almost seems like you can walk across uh, these birds and uh, step on their backs and not uh, even get wet. So one eared grebe will eat 25 to 30,000 brine shrimp per day. And, and I didn't say that wrong. That's one grebe eats 25 to 30,000 brine shrimp per day. And I, uh, one of the previous biologists on the program had calculated that uh, uh, the numbers of brine shrimp in the south arm of the Great Salt Lake was the equivalent of uh, the same uh, equivalent of the biomass of uh, 13,500 bull African elephants. So uh, that's a lot of production uh, on a good year. And so uh, how do you eat an elephant? That's the, what everybody always asks, one bite at a time. So these eared grebes can eat an elephant, uh, one brine shrimp bite at a time. So they, uh, these birds, how do we know how many there, there are here? We fly over, uh, take pictures of them uh, out of an airplane. Uh, then we take those uh, pictures, they're at a, a specific altitude. We take those back in and it's basically just dots on a, 
uh, uh, photograph, and somebody has to count all the dots to figure out how many grebes uh, there are at Great Salt Lake. And usually we get between two and five million. Uh, and so uh, that sometimes can be as much as 99% of the entire uh, eared grebe uh, population. Um, so five million eared grebes eating 25 to 30,000 brine shrimp a day for uh, about three months out of the year is a lot. So I don't know how many, that's a lot of zeros. So I, my calculator didn't go that high. Now, when these birds leave, there's in such great uh, big flocks that you can actually see them on uh, radar. So sometimes these, these flocks will be 10 miles wide, uh, 50 miles long. Uh, and they only fly at night because they're not very good flyers, and so uh, they only risk flying out of uh, Great Salt Lake at night. And usually once they start leaving, which is uh, typically in December when the brine shrimp uh, all freeze to death, uh, that's when we know that uh, we've hit uh, a point where we've gotten to the last part of our uh, seasons, uh, which is winter. And you wouldn't think that Great Salt Lake, uh, most areas that ha that freeze over, they don't provide a lot of opportunity for birds, uh, but Great Salt Lake, so salty enough, it typically doesn't freeze. Uh, and I say it usually doesn't freeze. We do sometimes get uh, an ice sheet uh, from some of the freshwater inflows like Bear River Bay, and uh, our crew's got to cut through that. Uh, still, even at that time, we get uh, uh, goals, California goals, as well as uh, ringbill goals that uh, are here in the middle of the winter uh, utilizing the lake, and they're still eating brine shrimp and uh, brine flies, unless they're in a parking lot eating french fries or something. Uh, then probably one of the uh, most uh, uh, recognizable because it's uh, our national symbol is the uh, bald eagle and Great Salt Lake is one of the top 10 winter has one of the top 10 wintering populations of bald eagles in the lower 48 usually well over 500 eagles come here and when they're here they're mostly uh, looking at, we draw our marshes down uh, on the waterfowl management areas uh, just to protect the infrastructure. And when we do that, it exposes a lot of these carp that have been swimming around all summer. Uh, and uh, they're out on the mud flat and that's what those eagles are uh, keyed in on. So they come and feed on the carp uh, in the dead of winter. So peak numbers, uh, February and um, March. One of the other species of uh, birds, uh, common golden eye, and they spend their time on the pelagic portions of uh, Great Salt Lake, so clear on the western side, uh, and they take advantage of uh, uh, the brine fly uh, larva. We have numbers that exceed or have uh, approached 50,000 uh, in the dead of winter, and that's one of the largest wintering inland populations ever recorded in North America. Uh, about twice as much as the lower Great uh, Lakes uh, has counted. And like I said, they're here to feed on those brine fly larvae that are uh, primarily focus, or, uh, uh, focused over those microbial light fields. Uh, so they're uh, diving down at this time of year and just picking these uh, uh, larvae off of those microbialites. Uh, however, the problem with that is that recent years we've seen uh, significant uh, loss or drying up of these microbialites, so that doesn't really, uh, you're not going to see a lot of birds diving in that location. So uh, we've seen our uh, uh, golden eye numbers uh, plummet, so we don't see near as many uh, in the last uh, decade or so. So I hope that gives you kind of uh, an idea of where we are as far as uh, uh, birds um, on Great Salt Lake. I will uh, just uh, mention a couple things here at the end. We've all seen these uh, articles in the news, the Great Salt Lake's drying up uh, uh, in five years, it's gonna be gone. I just wanted to kind of mention, and I think uh, Dr. Perry and bon everybody's kind of mentioned this a little bit, we've faced these crises before uh, and 
just as an example, in the early 1900s, uh, these water diversions, uh, and I think Sarah mentioned this uh, too, uh, these uh, started to deplete our uh, wetlands. So uh, as we started making canals and things, uh, we started seeing uh, our wetlands drop and then huge botulism outbreaks. And as a result, our legislature uh, at the time uh, appropriated money to purchase public shooting grounds to protect it as a wetland and uh, one of the, uh, I think the first ever uh, uh, waterfowl hunting grounds uh, purchased uh, uh, by state money. Then uh, not long after Bear River Migratory Bird Refuge, uh, uh, Locomotive Springs, Farmington Bay, um, and Ogden Bay, in fact, Ogden Bay um, was the first ever, uh, first ever dollars that uh, came from the Pittman Robertson funding uh, went to Ogden Bay. So Utah used the uh, first ever dollars uh, of that Pittman Robertson money here in uh, uh, Utah. So those things uh, occurred in uh, the early 1900s, Utah re recognized that there was an issue, and uh, we uh, uh, met with, met that crisis and was uh, were able to overcome it. Uh, similarly, earlier on in this uh, uh, in the early 2000s, we started seeing habitat loss uh, here uh, as well, and this is a photograph of Phragmites, which has encroached on a lot of uh habitat as well as all throughout the watershed and great salt lake or, or utah um, uh, started what was called the water watershed restoration initiative or wri and its intent was to increase watershed health and biological diversity uh, uh, improve uh, water quality and yield, as well as promote opportunities for sustainable uses of natural resources. So this uh, program has, and I looked it up uh, just recently, there's been over 2,500 projects completed to uh, over uh, about two and a half million acres uh, have been treated and uh, $350 million uh, spent on this uh, program. And that's state, federal, private uh, conservation uh, groups, all contributing to improve uh, uh, the watershed. So again, there was a, a crisis and uh, Utah did something about it. For our part, uh, we've uh, had uh, treated a lot of Phragmites in the, our uh, WMAs, 50,000 acres to where it's re been reduced to about 20% of its, uh, uh, of what it originally was. Um, and it's also, this money has also been used for uh, the sedimentation projects and building up islands to create, ha create habitat for nesting birds. Um, we've uh, also taken advantage of it to uh, re uh, build some of the dikes that were washed out in the 80s, as well as uh, provide new units uh, uh, built on our WMAs. And not only that, but sometimes when uh, private lands uh, are up for sale, uh, we've used that money as, uh, uh, to uh, as an acquisition uh, for that. So again, uh, a crisis uh, averted uh, um, utilizing, and we've actually had uh, calls from a lot of other states asking how how did you implement this program and get everybody on on board because it spans uh, uh, a lot of different uh, groups one of the last things that i'll mention is we had an issue uh in the 90s uh we uh with the commercial brine shrimp fishery taking off there was a potential for this becoming uh you know a concern for uh, over exploitation of this uh, resource and then have it impact uh, wildlife. Uh, but the industry uh, uh, got together with uh, wildlife and they asked to be regulated and they wanted to uh, make sure that uh, we policed them as well as done, did the research. And that's, uh, uh, I'm probably um, biased, but uh, that's probably uh, made it one of the best regular or best uh, managed uh, commercial fisheries in the world, because a lot of them uh, have hit that exploitation issue. So uh, as a result, uh, 
Uh, Great Salt Lake supplies still about 40 to 50 percent of the worldwide demand for uh, brine shrimp. So it's successful as far as industry goes. And uh, I would say five million ear grebes that have full tummies can't be wrong. So it, again, this was a, a problem that uh, was seen and solved. Um, and so I'll leave you the, with this quote uh, from Aldo uh, Leopold, and we kind of uh, stole that and used it as part of our uh, conservation objective at Great Salt Lake, and that's develop an informed, perceptive, and enduring constituency working toward long-term GSL ecosystem health and harmony between men and land. And that, uh, that sounds like something that Darren Perry would say because uh, uh, he's always stressing that. So maybe we uh, uh, are on the right track if uh, we're doing something uh, that he's talked about. So I have a picture of uh, uh, the railroad causeway here. And just recently, uh, the governor uh, raised the berm and uh, Dr. Perry talked about that earlier. Um, there's some give and take there, but that, uh, that just occurred in the last couple of months. And that is, uh, the intent there is to decrease the sal salinity as well as uh, bring the water levels up to inundate a lot of those microbialite habitats. So this is uh, another thing, the hard decision that had to be uh, made and it's uh, uh, happened just recently. So basically my takeaway from this is, uh, uh, Utah, in the, in, in the face of insurmountable odds, we have had a history of o overcoming these challenges. So um, I, I have end with a message of hope, I guess. So, and with that, I'm, I'm done and probably time to eat. <laughs> Let me just ask a, a, a question or two here um, from our Slido. With regard to the with regard to bird migration, are bird deaths tracked at the Great Salt Lake Park or at the southern end of the lake? And then it's follow up there. Have, has it increased as the lake has shrunk or has become more salty? Okay, so let me get to the first one. So bird deaths tracked. Uh, the only way we uh, uh, that we track. Uh, any deaths as if there's a, an outbreak. So if we actually see birds like dying from botulism or uh, cholera, and actually this year we did have some birds that were succumbing to avian flu, um, and we, uh, we collect those as quickly as we can, and then we take those in and have them uh, uh, tested at uh, USU and find out what, what they actually have. Uh, so th that's the only way we track uh, uh, deaths. Uh, we track the populations through monitoring and the surveys that we do. Uh, so we can see trends uh, for uh, the different species throughout time. And I'm sorry, what was your other question? Um, I just, I think it's okay. I have the increased as the lake has shrunk or become more salty. Okay. Um, so uh, one other question here, do you expect uh, a shortage of food for birds in the spring, given the issues that Dr. Baxter has described with brine shrimp and brine fly reproduction. So to what extent? Yeah, so I've, I've mentioned this uh, uh, a lot. So uh, Bonnie was talking about brine flies in the pelagic portions of the lake. And then uh, she uh, mentioned a little bit, uh, all these wetlands, uh, or as you get fresher, uh, you have a more diverse, uh, food sources as well as uh, the number of birds that utilize it. So uh, really what's keeping us hanging on for a lot of these birds is these managed wetlands, the impounded wetlands, because the bays are essentially gone. So you don't have Bear River Bay, Ogden Bay, and Farmington Bay. And those were a huge, uh, uh, that alkaline uh, mixosaline areas were a major uh, place for a lot of these birds to spend their time and we just don't have that uh, now. And then obviously I expect to see uh, impacts due to the lack of mic microbialite habitat and ultimately a loss of brine flies. Like, uh, uh, you know, when you walk out on the uh, edge of the lake and you don't see them, that's, that's actually a problem. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much.
After that very set of engaging speakers, we are going to adjourn for uh, lunch. Um, we will uh, start up promptly again at 12.55. And if you, you've noticed, we have actually started on time. So uh, just, just to be aware that we will be starting at 12.55. All right. Thank you all.